right, welcome back. Time now, 813, and it's time for this morning's first and finest. We're joined by Brian Foley of the Connecticut Department of Emergency Services and Public Protection. Brian, thanks so much for joining us this morning. First of all, let's start with some legislation that's been a big talker over the past month or so. Governor Lamont's office proposing legalizing recreational marijuana. It's been publicly supported by Commissioner Ravella, but then last week we saw the Connecticut Police Chiefs Association came out against it. Can we talk a little bit about this? Sure. So the CPCA, the Connecticut Police Chiefs, uh, is a great organization of police chiefs around the state. And there's no question uh, their, their main goal is the safety of the uh, municipalities who they protect. And uh, one of their main points was the ability to arrest somebody uh, for driving while uh, under the influence of drugs or marijuana and that there's no specific test. Like when you have a DUI, you have a breathalyzer available and you have a very specific and scientifically proven field sobriety test that's backed up with a breathalyzer. And that doesn't exist to this point. Uh, and that was their main concern. Uh, and to, to that, uh, we would say that, that they, those tests do exist, they are getting better, and we're working very closely with the state's attorney's office, the Yukon the Safety Transportation Research Center, uh, as well as the Department of Transportation uh, Highway Safety folks. We are in the process of already testing vendors that have uh, roadside kits uh, to test whether or not uh, somebody is under the influence of marijuana. So uh, while those kits aren't here and in police officers' hands yet, they are on the way. And there's another level of, of uh, testing on the road, and that's called a drug recognition expert. A police officer can become a drug recognition expert. Right now we have 50 in the state. They're already making a lot of those arrests, uh, dr driving while uh, under the influence of, of uh, drugs. And so uh, the problem is it's expensive to make them. It's a very difficult and challenging course. There's two steps to it without getting into the acronyms. There's an A-ride here in state, and then the DRE have to go out to Arizona to get it. So uh, we have 50 to this point. Obviously, we're working to, to make many more uh, and get them out there in the street. So the concern was uh, there's really no chemical test uh, to that. We say that chemical test is coming. And look at marijuana is here. It's been here. I just drove through Hartford. Now there's a billboard telling me about 14 minutes rides to the north up 91. There's a dispensary waiting for me right over the line there. So uh, when you have it uh, on your neighboring states, you begin to incur the problems. And with that, we saw that coming. And for years, uh, obviously, we've been working to improve the DRE pro the program, the Drug Recognition Expert Program. We're up to 50 now. Uh, it's all around our state here in Connecticut. So uh, we're doing our best to prepare for it also mentioned in this in their opposition uh, that marijuana might be a gateway drug, especially when we're dealing with the opioid crisis right now. Thoughts on that? So we understand that concern, uh, but but I have to say one, I talked to folks from the Harm Reduction Council here in Hartford yesterday. Uh, all they deal with is heroin addiction and the overdose crisis on the streets. Uh, therefore, the legalization of marijuana. And I want to go one step further. Uh, about three blocks uh, to my left here, uh, I worked during from 2006 to 2010, and without argument, uh, Frog Hollow, the epicenter of the heroin and opioid crisis and the overdose crisis here in the state of Connecticut, if not uh, the region. Uh, through that time, we didn't know what we had, and but we saw the heroin exploding. We didn't know why uh, back then, and we would do narcotic sweeps, and that is you scoop up the drug dealer, you put your own drug dealer, and then you start uh, arresting the users. And so you, you're arresting these users coming into the city and buying uh, heroin, and they're breaking down, and they're crying, and some of them are at all levels of addiction, horrible levels of addiction, where you can see that they're likely going to die soon. And you talk to these people, and they have moments of clarity. And I would walk by and ask them, how did you end up here on Putnam Street, living in a car? How, what happened? How did you end up here? Never once did a person say it's because of marijuana. Never. It was always because of pills. If not always, 95% because of the pill crisis. Marijuana has been around forever. The opioid crisis is new. There's no question how that started through the overprescription of the pills and the overavailability of the pill crisis. So while the intent and, and uh, their... their um, their, their point of a gateway drug, uh, I understand their concern, uh, but n no chief in at least the five big, big, biggest municipalities around the state are going to say the same thing. Let me, let me put it this way. If you take the five largest departments, I want to hear from those police chiefs uh, of those departments. Let's say New Haven, Bridgeport, Hartford, uh, Connecticut State Police, Colonel Maliklis, we know where him and Commissioner Ravella stand. If you take those five biggest departments, you're looking at about 25 to 30 percent of all the police officers in Connecticut. Those five biggest departments definitely make the most marijuana arrests, definitely have the most amount of citizens arrested for marijuana, and definitely seize the most marijuana. 
I'd like to hear from their opinion. Now, look, the, the, the Chiefs, the Connecticut Chiefs Police Association came out with that uh, statement. We get it. We understand. And they're the first to tell you it doesn't represent every police chief's opinion here. Uh, so look at they're a great organization uh, we were on different sides but we we all want what's best for this, the safety of Connecticut residents that's for sure on to another hot button issue now another late legislative issue there was a proposal to phase out school resource officers from school where does the department stand on this issue uh, so we obviously we hear uh, all the legislation and we understand the points. There is no question that having police officers in schools uh, it leads uh, to more arrests in schools. And of course, you hear about the pipeline from schools to prisons in your urban centers. Look, the the the. The idea of having a police officer in schools in a city like Hartford, Bridgeport, New Haven, or a town, a small town like a Glastonbury or Coventry, what that means to those, uh, the, the residents in those towns or cities is completely different. So you have to understand there's two sides to this. Uh, what we look for is an MOU, a memorandum of understanding with the schools, the police department, the teachers union and the security departments of the schools, a well-defined MOU of when and how police officers are gonna be used in schools and that arrest is the last resort. Cops are not to be used as a d disciplinary arm of the schools when students are misbehaving and the uniform should not be used as a deterrent. What we look for is uh, some language and we believe that language is already out there about a task force to review how police officers are gonna be used in schools, a task force, multiple disciplinary task force, uh, not just cops and teachers. Uh, you know, you're looking at psych psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, people, data experts to look at how it's affected. And we do believe there's better models out there. Look at some of the cities like Hartford and Waterbury that have PAL programs. It's not just a cop walk in a hallway. It's not just the PAL programs or not just the Police Athletic League, not just basketball on Friday night. This is structure. This is education. Uh, this is role models. This is nutrition. And so you look at those, the cities that are doing it right where the students come in. They have to do their homework. They're fed a good meal. They're shown positive role models. Yeah, sure. It, it, it's, it's, it's sports, but it's also it's music, uh, it's dance, there's all sorts of things that, that they get involved with, outdoor activities. Uh, so it's a lot more than just shooting hoops, and that's what people sometimes people think. So maybe uh, school resource officers, while they're great, and they are a good, uh, you know, well, teachers unions and teachers like to have them there as their first line of defense. Uh, a lot of times uh, security measures around the school are, are certainly a, the better money spent for keeping students safe. But we believe a task force needs to look at all these factors and come up with the best way to use officers about the Johnson and Johnson vaccine in particular a lot of these vaccines arriving here in Connecticut what's the Department of Emergency Services and Public Protection doing to help get this vaccine out there to people so we, we were in a meeting the other day and that Johnson and Johnson vaccine was coming fast within hours and uh, we knew that some of the municipalities a lot of the clinics uh, I believe we have around 100 around the state that are that are uh, obviously giving out the vaccine we wanted to get them out around the state quickly and what's the best way to do that Colonel Malik is the Connecticut State Police stood up and said the troopers are always ready they're ready right now to get that vaccine out and that's what they did they hustled down to the uh, Department of Public Health with a little help from General Levi and the, and the Army National Guard they were able to get it packaged out and deliver delivered out around the state in quick time. And look, there, I'm, I'm, I sat on the meetings this week and I know things are starting to get better, but uh, watching the meetings, there's an incredible sense of urgency and stress uh, to the point where, look, we're gonna have these troopers get it out uh, this fast uh, around the state. So they're not slowing down in this end. And the state of Connecticut is in the, the top three states around the country, over a million doses out. And I know everyone hears, you know, someone's got a complaint of how they went to get their dose. We also know so many other people that are, that are doing well. So I think we're doing great here in the state of Connecticut. We're not ready to uh, spike the football and, and we're not in the end zone yet, but uh, boy, we're getting down towards the red zone, that's for sure. Uh, things are going good. The Connecticut State Police have done this a couple times. There's some great video of them doing it here. So always ready to help with the National Guard. And we are here, the Department of Emergency Service and the Public Protection, as a support arm of the Department of Public Health. Uh, and the state of Connecticut is, is doing great, again, with top three of the country. Glad to see it's all hands on deck right now. I know there's a big promotion, a Lieutenant Colonel you wanted to mention. Let's talk about it. Yeah, Lieutenant Colonel, yeah, yeah thanks. Lieutenant Gert and Colonel uh, Goncalves was promoted to, uh, again, Lieutenant Colonel from Major uh, this week, uh, over 20 years of experience, uh, and he is uh, trilingual, uh, obviously a, a good guy that we've, we've uh, seen around the, the, the Connecticut State Police here for the last couple years, uh, very, very deserving of the promotion. After he got promoted, though, this week, it occurred to me and it hit me, wait a minute, this is the guy in Hartford over the summer 
that led the Connecticut State Police in the protests up on the highway, that he's the one that partnered uh, and worked with the protesters, uh, and he's the one that when they all gathered around, they all took a knee. No arrests, no injuries, no property damage. This shows a person who is a leader, who can think on the fly uh, and can de-escalate and also uh, can, can build bridges within the community in a quick fashion. And that's what he did there, that's what he showed there, so congratulations to him and we're proud to have him as a Lieutenant Colonel now. Uh, congratulations, Lieutenant Colonel Goncalves. Congratulations to him. And real quick, before you go, I do want to ask you, I know that in Southington we had a uh, DUI incident yesterday morning, early yesterday morning, also involving a state trooper, the state trooper being dragged. Any update? Is that officer okay? And any update on this case? Yeah, yes, the troopers doing well. And again, great, great work by the troopers. We do have uh, video of that. We hope to have that out uh, this week and we're showing just how dangerous and just how fast things happen uh, up with the Connecticut State Police or being a law enforcement officer. Uh, so we hope to have that uh, that this week. They're getting arrest made. The troopers doing OK. Great work by the Connecticut State Police up on the highway yesterday. Ryan Foley, thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you. All right. OK, still to come this morning.